Growth stocks recently went on a really nice rally. Tesla's up almost 8%. Microsoft and Apple is up almost 2%. And if you're into buy now pay later, Afterpay is up almost 13% with Zip up almost 4%. The reason why I'm making this video is that this entire year, we either had inflation scares or crash of the century type articles, literally all year long. Some articles even go as far as saying that S&P 500 is staring down a 12 years worth of negative returns. Now with this video, I'm not trying to say that we're all good in the hood and a market crash isn't likely going to happen. It probably is going to happen, we just don't know when. But if the market does tank like the way that the bears describe it, then our favorite growth stocks are gonna go on a massive discount. Depending on whether you are a half glass full or half glass empty kind of person, then you're either going to see this as an opportunity or not. Well, either way, in this video, I am gonna show you how I prioritize growth stocks on my watch list, especially the ones with little to no cash flow. As usual, if you do learn something new, it will mean the world to me if you could gently smash a like button somewhere around here and no, this video is not financial advice or recommendation to do anything. So without further ado, let's go. I wanna quickly talk about my process so you understand where I'm coming from. I actually started off as a pure fundamentals kind of guy. So financial statements, crunching numbers, current ratios, so on and so forth. What I soon realized is that in the pandemic crash, it's very hard to get your capital allocation wrong because everything is going up. So what I soon realized entering into this year is that you can still get the fundamentals right but it could take years for that to pan out just because the macro backdrop isn't good. So now my process is, it has to be a favorable macro environment, really good fundamentals and a really good chart setup. Only after I tick all three boxes, then I choose to allocate capital into whatever that company is. Now, technicals is a work in progress for me, but I will share a little bit of that in this video. One more thing, this video is going to be an extension of this video right here because I focus a lot on companies with tons of cash flow in this video and how to do qualitative research. The qualitative research part is applicable to any companies, but I just wanted this video to be an extension of that so that if you're looking at a company with little cash flow, you can watch this one and then go back to this one to understand how to do qualitative research. We've talked about macro a lot in the past, so I'm just gonna put that aside and acknowledge that in the current macro environment, it's not good for companies with little cash flow, like for example, Affirm, Afterpay, Sezzle, and Zip. The only reason why I'm focusing on buy now pay later companies is because it's relevant. A lot of people are interested in it, so this will be a good example to use. And the reason why PayPal is here is because we're going to use PayPal as a way to gauge relative valuation in just a second. Now you can see that from their 52 week high, a lot of the companies with little cash flow got a pretty big correction, right? A firm had a correction of 56, almost 60% at one point, 70% to around 68% for open pay and Afterpay had a 20% correction. The only reason why it doesn't look as bad is because they recently went on a rally and similar to Zip as well. The next thing I like to do is to go through a simple three-step process just to gauge if there's some kind of uh, incentive for me to do qualitative research. I just don't wanna go down the rabbit hole of doing qualitative research just to realize that there is no opportunity in this company. The first step is to find the two-year revenue CAGR. Now CAGR stands for compounded annual growth rate. The easiest way and the free way of doing this is just go to ticker, go to estimates, change the time frame to get one year actual two year estimate and then you get a CAGR of 73%. So that's what I put for Afterpay and then you focus on the rest uh, in your own time. And then we do enterprise value as well. So go to overview, go to total enterprise value. So that's 37 billion. That's what I have over here as well. Find the last 12 month revenue, go to financials, go to last 12 month and then look at the total revenue. So it'll be 671 million dollars and that's what i have the ev to the last 12 months revenue really simple you just take this number divided by that number and you'll get a last 12 month ev revenue multiple so when we look at the revenue multiple on its own we're like holy crap afterpay is incredibly expensive but we always have to put things in perspective because there's a reason why the market is always willing to pay a premium for afterpay and the answer comes down to the growth rate. When we look at Afterpay's revenue growth rate, analysts are expecting them to grow 73% per year over the next two years. 
and they're currently generating 671 million dollars in revenue so to have this kind of growth rate with this kind of revenue it's not surprising to me why the market is willing to pay such a big premium for afterpay another way to put things in perspective is to actually adjust that revenue multiple by the growth rate the way to do that is take 55 divided by 73 and please divide by the whole number not the actual decimal because you'll get some wonky numbers then you can find the growth adjusted revenue multiple over here now what's really interesting is that when we adjust the revenue multiple by growth we're essentially paying the same multiple for paypal but you can see that we're skipping ahead over here that paypal have little expected returns and i'll talk about this process in just a second that's because paypal is not classified as a growth company they're generating so much cash flow that's absolutely stupid so looking at ev revenue for paypal is not a good way to do this if we do a discounted cash flow model for paypal i can almost guarantee we're going to get a significantly different outcome so that's just to put things in perspective right and then when we look at the rest like for example open pay and Sezzle, Zip, and also Affirm, you can see that OpenPay have one of the lowest growth adjusted EV revenue multiple. Is that necessarily a good thing? No, it's not necessarily a good thing because why is the market not paying the multiple that they deserve? There's a reason for that, right? And I think a lot of the reasons is actually qualitative. Do they have the PayPal Mafia premium like Affirm and the execution like PayPal Mafia? No, they don't. Do they have the M&A transaction experience at Zip? No, they don't. So just because you have a really cheap growth adjusted revenue multiple doesn't mean that it's a good thing. It, everything needs to be put into context so we understand whether we can actually make decisions out of that. The last step is to find a fair EV revenue multiple for that company after two years. And then by doing that, find the exit enterprise value after two years. And then we will essentially compare this with that to get an expected return. So to find this number right here, what we'll do is we'll go back to ticker, go to valuation, and then we will click on last 12 month EV revenue and we'll ultimately chart this graph right here. Stretch it to three years, five years, however much time frame you can possibly get. And you can see that Afterpay trades at a 40 times last 12 month EV revenue on average. So I think that at 40 times in the current macro environment, it's probably still a little bit high to be perfectly honest. But with a company this high quality like Afterpay, the market will always command a premium. So I think anywhere between that 30 to 35 times will be fair. So for margin of safety and for sanity six, let's put in 30. You wanna repeat the steps for the rest of the companies. And then to get exit enterprise value, you ultimately use the last 12 month revenue grow it by two years and then times by 30 which is the fair multiple that we're giving after pay and then we compare the exit enterprise value with the current enterprise value and after two years the expected return is around 62 63 percent now that's not amazing and i wouldn't necessarily say that that would incentivize me to do more qualitative research but you can see that there's definitely some that would incentivize me to do some research and personally speaking I'm not that interested in companies besides the bigger buy now pay later companies. I, I think that the industry as a whole is ultimately going to be a winner take most. So what I have on my watch list is Affirm and Zip. The last thing I like to do is technical analysis. Now, if you don't believe in TA, you can always jump ahead to my portfolio update. But I found this world to be really, really fascinating. And something that I've been learning more recently is called Elliott Wave Theory. And the whole idea of Elliott Wave Theory is that in a bull market for a commodity or currency or a stock, it tends to move up in a five wave structure. So you have one, two, three, four, five. And then once you're at the fifth wave, that's really when you run out of buyers essentially. And then you, have, you start a corrective wave down. So A, B, C on the way down. Now, if you look more precisely, you can actually see that within these bigger waves up, which is what you call an impulse wave, you have a five-way structure on the upside. So one, two, three, four, five, and then ABC on the way down. So this is generally a structure for a bull market. And for a bear market, then it'll be the exact opposite. Basically, you have five waves down. So one, two, three, four, five, and then three waves up, and then five waves down again. So applying the earlier wave theory, I'm just trying to understand whether we are at the bottom of wave four or are we at the top of the impulse waves. I just don't want to catch a falling knife because at the end of the day, 
I can get the fundamentals somewhat right. I can get the macro somewhat right, but it could take years or months for that stock pick to pan out if the chart doesn't line up. So this is just me adding an additional step to my process to round out my process. I'll share my thoughts on Afterpay and Zip. And if you'd like me to share my thoughts on the other companies as well, just let me know in the comment section below. So with Afterpay, the first thing we have to do is stretch out the time frames so that we can see where the waves are coming from. It's really easy to miscount waves if we don't see where the waves are coming from. So the good thing is Afterpay has a really clean structure. So you can see that one, two, three, four, five. That makes essentially the full cycle before we get a corrective wave down. So ABC on the way down, that makes the full cycle that starts a new wave count. So you can go one, two, three, four, five. And I think that we are on our way to finish wave five. If we zoom in a little bit, we can actually see a pretty clean structure. So you can see that at the bottom of wave four, one, two, three, four, five. And we are currently finishing off wave three. And when we look at the RSI, it's so overbought, I think it's ready to correct. And then basically a final wave up and that would complete the entire wave. So this cycle right here, and I think that'll be essentially a three-way structure down. Now, however long that takes to, you know, finish wave five, you know, it might take end of the year to finish that. So I have no idea, but that looks like a complete cycle to me. So for me, I'm just not that interested in Afterpay at the moment. With Zip, it's pretty confusing to me. And let me walk you through my logic so you can see where I'm coming from. We always do the same thing. We stretch the time frame so we can see where the waves are coming from. So you can see that there is one, two, three, four, five. That makes wave one of five. And then a corrective wave that makes two of five. And then you go one, two, three, four, five. That makes three of five. And then you have A, B, C correction into four of five. And the final wave, one, two, three, four, five. That makes five of five. And that completes the whole cycle. Then we should get an A, B, C correction. And we did, we got A, B, and C. And this correction was pretty big. So I think from peak to trough was around 53 to around 55% towards the end of December. So what I'm currently unsure of is whether this is the bottom or the end of this entire one, two, three, four, five cycle right here because you can always interpret this completely differently. And instead of saying this is wave C and this is the end, you can actually say wave C is somewhere over there. This is wave B and this is wave A. So A, B, and then C. If this is the end of that cycle and we're starting a new cycle, this looks like a bull cycle to me, right? Like one, two, three, four, five. And momentum is starting to build as well. But the macro environment doesn't tell me that this is a good company to have. So because currently I'm unsure, I just put it on my watch list. I'll come back to this another time when the chart develops a little bit more. Just a quick portfolio update. As I'm recording this video, my CMC market portfolio is worth around 100,000 Australian dollars, which is a great number to be. And hopefully it'll be a little bit more because I'll be depositing a little bit more cash into this account. And overall, I made no changes to the side of the portfolio. Everything is still very much the same. And I'm, I'm happy the fact that Asia is starting to recover and Micron is starting to work in my favor, but we'll see how the next couple months pan out because ultimately Micron is a relatively long-term hold for me. So I'm not too stressed about short-term fluctuations, but it's nice to see that we're moving towards the right direction. As many of you know, I've started a short-term portfolio, basically six to 12 months to learn more about technical analysis, especially earlier wave theory. I think the best way to learn is actually have some skin in the game, but my process doesn't change. For a company to show up on my short term, it has to be macro plus fundamentals plus technicals. If I miss any of those, I just won't have it in my short-term portfolio. I won't share what I'm holding in my short-term portfolio because it's very experimental, but I do share it in Discord because I can. So hopefully in the future, when I have more learnings to share with you, I'll share my short-term portfolio. With my stake portfolio, which is like all US stocks, it's currently at 43,000 USD. So give or take approximately 53,000 USD. And as it stands, I'm pretty surprised by the growth rally recently. And this is one of the main reasons why I'm making this video because it could be very, very short term because uh, institutional investors might have over rotated into value stocks and then realized that there are so many growth names at a very reasonable price. And we might be seeing that rotation back into growth, at least for the next couple months before value really, really takes off. 
at the end of the day, valuation does matter. So this is one of the main reasons why I'm making all of these videos about valuation. On this side of my portfolio, I didn't make any changes at all. I'm very, very happy with majority of my holdings at the moment, and I'm mostly invested. I have a bit of cash here and there. I'm trying to be as fully invested as I possibly can. And the only growth stock with little cash flow that I have is either Twilio or Disney. Now, Disney is almost considered as a growth stock because their cash flow is not back yet because they do make a lot of money from cruises and also theme parks. So not quite there yet. But other than that, maybe Ozone will be another one. Now, I'm not sponsored by Stake, but if you do want to try Stake for yourself and wouldn't mind a free stock, I have left a link in the description box below. Thank you so much for hanging out with me all the way to the end. If you did learn something new, consider gently smacking the like button right there. Subscribe to my channel, click onto the bell so that when I release future videos, I can let you know. If you're still bored, I left a video on the screen that I think it's incredible to watch next. And as usual, Otto will always do the honors and I'm gonna see you very, very soon 